Hey everybody, Darren Burroughs here. Today I'm here with Paul Hecht and we're going to be talking about how we can use our RRSPs to invest in real estate. Before we get into it with Paul, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for both Paul and myself. And without further ado, let's get into it, Paul. Uh, great to have you here, my friend. Uh, thanks for taking some time out of your day to join us, talk all about RRSP investing, which is such a popular topic with real estate investors. Once they actually figure out they can use their RRSPs, they're so excited about it. But there are certain things that we have to do. But before we get into it, uh, give us a bit of an intro on who you are as a real estate and what you do in this space. Well, thank you very much, Darren. It is always a pleasure talking with fellow real estate investors who are actively doing this. And uh, mm. so thanks for having me on the, on the call. Um, like you, I'm a real estate investor. I've been doing this 20 years. Uh, I've used other people's RSPs to invest in real estate on um, multiple projects before. So very familiar with it, but it is definitely um, a topic that has a lot of mystery to it. And you definitely have to do it right. Uh, you can't be collapsing your RSP and paying taxes on it. and yeah, I've seen a lot of people do it incorrectly also. So um, yeah, I'm glad that, uh, you know, you wanted to have that conversation with mm. uh, someone who has been doing it. And uh, I always welcome that. So thank yeah. you very much for having me on, Darren. Paul's being a, a little humble with his background. Paul's, uh, you know, you've been, you've been a teacher, a trainer for, for many, many years. You have a, you know, a fantastic portfolio of properties. Uh, you know, you've, you've been, very successful in this space. And so super grateful to have you here with us and, and explaining the different things that we can do with our RSPs. Uh, let's start with the most basic ones that probably most people are familiar with, and we'll kind of uh, gradually move on from there. Obviously, the first time home buyer plan is, uh, is a great plan. I mean, if, if you haven't used everyone should use that once because you can use it once. Hmm. And you can use the money inside your RSP towards a down payment on your first property which as you know, over time, real estate has outperformed any mutual fund or what most people keep in their RSP. So everyone should maximize that for sure and use that one time. And then it's really, um, you know, most people have mutual funds in their RSPs and they could be doing a lot more with those mutual funds. Um, they could be investing in, in things that are backed by real estate, such as MIX, mortgage investment corporations, they could be investing in uh, limited partnerships with developers. Now, oftentimes those come with um, accreditation and there's more requirements to do that. But generally speaking, mix or REITs, um, anyone can invest in those and those are backed by real estate. So those are, those are other good options if you want to not be invested into the market with your, your, uh, your RSPs, right? And I guess when we're talking about this too, it's not just the RSP, it's it's the RIF, it's the Lira, it's the TFSA, as long as they're self-directed, meaning as long as you can pick which stock or which bond you want to buy, then you can you you have that flexibility to select a lot more other options uh, that are backed by real estate. And I think that's a big question that I get a lot, Paul, is just the the, the procedure around getting those funds into a self-directed position because um, we say self-directed, we know what that means. We know that we can uh, go to only certain financial institutions in Canada that will do this. Um, most people will go to their bank and say, I want to self-direct my RSPs. And they will say, absolutely, we'll do that for you. We'll self-direct into any one of these 10 products that uh, basically are our products that we sell here at the bank. But what we're talking about is getting outside of, of, of you know, the standard big six banks and getting um, into another financial institution that allows you to then truly self-direct your RSPs. Um, so explain a little bit about that process and, and how it works for people that have never done it. Yeah. Good point. Good point. I, you know, I just jump right over that oftentimes because <laughs> I don't even think about that other world, but yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's a very important uh, point in terms of self-directing. Um, so CRA allows all kinds of investments with inside your RSP, but the banks only administer a certain amount of those. So there might be 20 uh, eligible investments that you're allowed to do inside your RSP. And then you need someone to administer that for you. So the banks act as that role. The banks administer your RSP. So when they're administering them, they only administer maybe 10 out of the 20 that are actually allowed by CRA. So when they say, you know, you can't do that, 
Well, it's not that you can't do that. It's just that you can't do it with them because they don't administer it, mm. right? And people often get stuck when, you know, they try and do some private lending from their RSP, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's arm's length or non-arm's length. And you want to, you know, do some private lending and they go to their bank and they say, I want to do this. And the bank says, you can't do that in your RSP. And you're like, oh, dang, Darren told me this or Paul said I could. And now I go to my bank and I can't do it. It's like, well, because the only reason you can't do it is because your bank won't administer it. We're allowed to do it by CRA. But like you said, you have to find a, a, usually a trust company, um, an alternate bank who will administer it for you. Basically, you're looking for a different administrator. And the other thing, the point you made earlier too, that I think a lot of people skip over is they automatically think, okay, I'm taking my RRSP out of wherever it is right now. I'm going to have to pay tax on that money because I'm taking it out of that financial institution and I'm taking it over to this trust institution, the new administrator, and I have to pay tax. And so why would I ever do that? But that's not the case either. And most people don't understand how that works. So explain a little bit about that process. So we're still keeping it inside the RSP. We're not going to bank A saying, hey, give me a check for my $100,000 in my RSP and then walking across the street and depositing it into the new trust company with a new self-directed. We're leaving it inside the RSP plan. All we're doing is we're transferring it from one institution to the other. And in fact, don't touch the money. Like, don't put your hands on it. Don't get a check. Do not ask for cash. Like, none of that. The best way to do it is go set up a brand new uh, self-directed account with a trust company, give them your statement and say, transfer my existing RSP over to you, right? And now all we're doing is we're transferring it. We're not collapsing it. We're not withdrawing it. As soon as you hear the, the word withholding tax, then you're doing this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop, put on the brakes. <laughs> but Paul, you are called me. <laughs> yeah, rewind, go back a few steps, exactly. Open up the account, bring the statement and ask them to pull funds as opposed to trying to push funds to the new location. Because I tell you what, you've got funds with big bank number one, two through six. And you say, can you push these funds over to, you know, the trust company? They're going to take their sweet time doing that. Whereas if it's a pull from the other financial institution that happens very quickly, there's really no um, process that you have to be concerning yourself with. And like you say, just keep your hands off that money. Let the two financial institutions handle it. It'll happen very quickly. Yeah. I've, I've seen, I've seen banks take up to eight months to push. And I've I, I believe it has to, if it goes the other way, if you're doing the pull, I believe it has to be done within 21 days. Otherwise, the institution who they're pulling from, if they don't do it, they get fines. What are some of the other ways that we can be using when we get it into that self-directed position? What kinds of products can we be investing in? Yeah, so let's take the example of a real estate investor who now wants to um, you know, have some extra cash. Say, I'll use an example of a property yep. and then it's a clear illustration, right? So for example, this, uh, let's see. Okay, so we'll put this image in people's mind, right? So mm -hmm. this is a, a project that we are building. It's new construction. It's gonna be a sixplex, luxury rental, uh, rooftop patio, it's right? All the hot tubs up there, all the pretty mm -hmm. stuff, okay? Yeah. So as a real estate developer, this is a $3 million project, right? Between the land and the construction, right down to the, the furnishings and the plates and the spoons and everything, right? It's about $3 million. So as an investor, then I'm going to have to come up with about a million dollars between the, the down payment, the, uh, the you know, construction costs, all the rest of it. And then what I'll do as a developer is I'll qualify for the $2 million of financing. Um, I'll sign a personal guarantee, right? So that's what I do as the developer. Mm -hmm. So that million dollars can either come out of my pocket now as a developer or I could try and find someone else to help put that money into the project. And then I can do that a couple of different ways. I could either borrow a mortgage, right? And then in this case, it'd be a second mortgage. So say I'm going to borrow a $500,000 second mortgage, right? Well, I'd go to a private lender. I'd go to someone who's going to lend that to me. We'd figure out the interest rate. Well, with the RRSP, inside the RRSP, the RSP is allowed to also be a private lender, hmm. right? So now whoever has RSPs, they can now be lending this as first mortgage, second mortgage, right? 
to someone secured now on a property like this one, and then they get an interest rate and that interest goes back into their RRSP. payment. So that is now an eligible investment allowed within, within the inside the RSP, and now their RSP is earning interest. Okay, so that's the, the typical kind of example of how people use their RSPs for lending and having a mortgage inside their RSP instead of a instead of mutual fund one two three. It says six one five Francis RSP mortgage. So you're so essentially that, acting as a bank now. You you're taking your RSP money yeah. and you're lending it out like any other bank would lend it out at a usually mm -hmm. a much higher interest rate than what the banks yeah. would be lending out at because it's secured in sometimes first, second or third position to somebody who might not have the ability to qualify at the A lender category. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's one way we can do it. Is there, and, and I think one thing we have to mention too is that the reason that we're allowed to lend out funds in this case, so the way you're talking is that we're arm's length uh, away from that transaction. We actually don't own a piece of that property. Um, we are, uh, if we own it, uh, we're now uh, non-arm's length and there's different rules that we can do with our RSPs, but because we're not um, a direct owner, we're actually a mortgager, we can we can do that in what's called an arm's length transaction. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so your RSP can lend to anyone not related by blood marriage or adoption, right? So that's called, like you say, an arm's length mortgage. And there's certain rules and regulations around an arm's length mortgage. Um, it can only be up to 100% total loan to value. There's a certain interest rate you have to charge between 3% and 30%. Um, there's guidelines around it for sure about how you can actually do that loan. It gets, uh, it gets a more uh, a lawyer registers it, right? Just like they would when you're borrowing money. You know, a lawyer's going to register that as a mortgage on this property. So you have security, right? So if I don't pay, you can foreclose, you can get the money back. So it's all, all the same tools that a regular mortgage has. So yeah, in this case, it'd be non -arm, or arm's length, sorry, arm's mm -hmm. length mortgage. Mm -hmm. Now the non-arm's length, that would be if I was doing this property, I was developing the building and I wanted to borrow $500,000. Well, I then could also use my own RRSP and my own RRSP could also be the private lender, right? So a lot of people have a lot of money in their RRSPs and they're like, they're just sitting there doing nothing. They're in mutual funds or the fees are eating them up. And they're like, could I lend it to myself? You can. Um, it, yeah, it's a lower loan to value. And it, it has to be fully insured by CMHC. So there's a whole other layer of parameters. You have to pay a lot of fees. Um, typically, you're going to pay about a 3% fee. And it's not just going to be on the the first mortgage is gonna be on the first plus the second. So in this case, if I had a $2 million mortgage, plus I borrowed 500,000 from my own self, then in that case, right? So I'm now gonna register a second mortgage on my own property and my R RSP is actually gonna register it. My RSP is the lender in this case, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to pay a fee, not on the 500, I have to pay the CMHC fee on 2.5 million. Wow. So it gets pretty expensive to use your yeah. own money to do it. Um, but there is another way we can do this okay. <laughs> by <laughs> using the RRSPs in a strategic way with the arm's length transaction. So say, for example, Darren, say you had 500,000, right? Mm -hmm. And say, I, don't. You, yeah, right. <laughs> I, know. I don't have RRSPs anymore either. I just, I, <laughs> they're too restrictive. But I don't have $5 in my RRSPs, but no, I'm kidding. I do. <laughs> I don't have any RSPs. I don't, I don't like them, right? <laughs> but there's a lot of people who have them and they're just sitting there yeah. doing nothing. It's like, use them for something, right? Hmm. So say you did have 500, right? Okay. And in this case, we could also do five people at 100,000 a piece, hmm. right? And what that's called, it's called syndicating or pooling it together. And then everyone is in second position and there's one $500,000 second mortgage then registered on the property. So how do we get cash then if we, if you know, if we if we're not using the RSP? Say you lend me $100,000. Mm -hmm. I now have $100,000. Maybe I register that on 
on my house, not on this building. Yep. Right. So I now borrow a hundred thousand dollars from you. That's now an arm's length mortgage. I now have a hundred grand. I can now put a hundred grand into this deal and it'd be cash. Mm -hmm. So now it's an equity position, right? Where now I'm getting cash flow. I'm getting paid down on the property as the property appreciates. I'm getting part of it because I've now invested into the equity of the property. Right. Yep. So now we've done that. So now maybe, maybe I have a hundred thousand in my RSP also. And maybe I now lend that to, to Susan, okay? Whoever Susan is. And then Susan, right? And then we now I register a $100,000 mortgage on her property. She now has $100,000. And now she, she now has $100,000 cash to now invest in your project, right? So now you're doing some deals, Darren, I know in, in Ontario. Yeah. Now she has 100 grand, right? So now what's happened in your case is you've lent uh, your 100,000 to me you're going to, I'm paying your RSP in interest rate. So your RSP is earning interest. And at the same time, cause you knew me, I talked to Susan. Susan was interested in your deal. She was, would like to put some cash in, right? Or she's now going to lend you the RSP and it's going to get registered on your property. And then now you have cash and now you can take that cash. And now you can invest it in my project, mm -hmm. right? So you can see how we can utilize this if we have a couple different people who are wanting to not just lend and get a rate of return but they also want to get equity in the property also could we let's say i lent my money to you paul you and we've secured a mortgage on your property i now have cash um you you lent your money to somebody else um they now have cash. Could we all invest in the same project together in a cash position with equity or does it have to be in separate projects? So take um, your million dollars that you need for your project. Yeah. Could we kind of lend to a couple of different people to eventually get that kind of cash back in our hands? And then could we all invest in the same project or does it have to be on a different project altogether? No, you can do that um, because once you've borrowed the money, it's cash. You, right. can, you can kind of do whatever you want with the cash. You could buy a boat if you wanted with the cash, right? You don't have to put it in a property, but as a real estate investor, we always want to keep our money going. Mm -hmm. Now, the only caveat there is some people say, well, we don't need Susan, right? Darren, you and I know each other. I'll lend you a hundred and you lend me a hundred and I'll charge you 4%. You charge me 4%. We'll do a one-year term. Okay, if we do that, that's called an RSP swap. That is actually... Um, not allowed by CRA yeah. because CRA doesn't see that that is a true commercial transaction, hmm. right? They're saying, no, basically I lent you a hundred and you lent me a hundred and we did it on the same day. We're just funding each other's deals. There's no true commercial transaction going on here. If you lend to me on Friday, a hundred grand, 4%. And then two weeks from now, I lend to Susan at 3.5%. Right. And now a month later, she now lends to you. Well, those are true commercial transactions that have happened, right? Mm -hmm. We've had each had a look at each other's properties. We've we've seen, does that make sense as a loan? And it just so happens that we now all have cash that's come out because we've borrowed basically equity from each other's properties. Question probably is like, why would somebody borrow money at four percent? But then to turn around and look at your transaction that you're building in, in Kelowna, you know, the returns are significantly higher than, than 4%. And that's when it makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. So, so if someone bored at say 4%, right. Say they borrow a hundred thousand at 4%, that's going to cost them $4,000 a year. Right. So maybe it's two years, right. They're like, okay, it's going to cost me $8,000 per year on a project like this. What, what uh, we do is we have a projected rate of return. So projected rate of return could be in the, in the you know, 14, 15, 16% rate of return on their money. So they're going to borrow $100,000 at 4%. It's going to cost them $4,000 a year. Well, now let's use 15%. They're going to make $15,000 on the 100 they invest into the equity. You know, they're basically taking the spread. Mm -hmm. is what they're doing. It's just like the banks, right? Banks borrow from us, they pay us 1% and then they lend it out at 3%. Yeah. They're just taking the spread. They're doing, right? Yeah. We're doing the exact same thing. And the difference being, I think that uh, I want to clarify is that you're in a cash position now. So yeah, 
as opposed to being a lender in your RSP, that money has to stay inside your RSP. Yeah. Because we're essentially in a cash position now, the spread that we make, we get to keep in the form of cash. Exactly. You're paying 4%, but you're collecting 15%. So the difference is 11%. So that 11% is actually outside of the RSP and the 4% is inside the RSP. The other thing you can do too is, is maybe you don't want that four, maybe you're going to borrow 100,000, right? But you don't want to pay that $4,000 each year of interest, right? You're like, I don't want another payment. Well, you can pay up front. You might say, Paul, I want two years of interest paid up front to do, to do this loan. So you now lend me a hundred, that hundred thousand goes to the lawyer's account. The lawyer then cuts you a check back for 8,000, which is two years of $4,000, right? Mm -hmm. So I now have $92,000 to use for the next two years with no payments. So I like that because I don't have any payments. Yeah. You have $8,000 back into your RSP account. You've already been paid for the next two years right? And that 8,000 now, you can now lend out that $8,000 again. Mm. Right? Interesting. And the other, I guess the other option is to, which doesn't have the same effect as the, the prepaid interest, but you have the, the ability to, to uh, be a balloon payment at the end as well. So if you didn't want to have that yearly payment, you could say, okay, interest is all going to be accrued at the end so that when I get that return by investing in your project, you know, uh, on your six building, your six unit building, when I get my funds, I'm going to pay back the interest of the balloon payment at the end. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So all kinds of different ways to, <laughs> <laughs> to do it. You just have to make sure you're doing it properly. Right. And just make sure you get a good administrator and <laughs> yeah, I think that's the, the big piece for, for many people that they're missing is potentially, you know, um, a, a knowing what what's available to them and then like you say having a having mm -hmm. a good administrator on their side to to work them through this thanks yeah. for taking some time out of your day to to walk us through a really clear for me um our many different options with rsp investing if you guys enjoyed the session with paul uh, go ahead and hit the like button below you can also subscribe to my channel hit the notification bell and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for both of us you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Paul, thanks again for being here, um, taking some time out of your busy day to, to join us. I uh, wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey on this project specifically. I know it's going to be a great one. I can't wait to come out and see it uh, the next time I'm in Kelowna. And uh, we, will, we will hopefully be, uh, you know, be able to be in the same room again at some point very soon and uh, talk real estate and all the things that we like to chat about. So thanks again for taking some time out of your day to be here. My pleasure, Darren. It's been uh, it's been a blast. I love talking about stuff and talking to other investors and showing how, how they can make some money. So my pleasure. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Paul. Talk to you soon.